Good morning. I'd like to thank Lita for the invitation to come here today and talk to you about our work um, and how it relates uh, with our HMP demonstration project on atopic dermatitis. We've heard a lot about the gut microbiome, and I think it was nicely uh, organized that Susan's talk about the skin and wound healing um, segues very well into my focus on the skin microbiome. And one of the overarching questions that has developed in our time in looking at the skin microbiome is, um, do skin microbes influence, influence host skin immunity? Um, I'm going to give some background for those who are not familiar with the skin microbiome work in order to be able to talk about um, the microbiome in eczematous skin. I'm highlighting here a series of experiments by a collaborator, Yasmin Belcade's group, to highlight some of the differences that we see in that this not only is the skin microbiome different than other body sites, but that the skin immunity and the skin microbial relationship is also distinct. Here, um, Shruti, who was um, a graduate student in Yasmin's lab, she treated SPF mice. These are all um, experiments in mice with antibiotics, and what we can see in the gut that after antibiotic treatment, there is a significant shift in the microbial communities, but you don't see those significant changes in the skin microbial communities. Also, Shruti looked at the um, immune cells that were in the gut, IL-17A, as well as interferon gamma producing cells in the gut, and as compared to the skin, once there was treatment with antibiotics, there was a, a significant reduction in the interf I, um, interferon gamma and IL-17A producing cells. So there are, dis in distinct epithelia, there are differential responses to antibiotic treatment, at least in these mice. So Shruti then went on, and in comparing SPF mice and germ-free mice, SPF mice here, germ-free mice, looking at IL-17A producing T cells in the gut and the skin, we see here that there are reduced IL-17A producing T cells in the germ-free gut and skin. However, what she then did was topically mono-associated staph epidermidis in these germ-free mice, and interestingly, there were no changes in the uh, IL-17A producing T cells in the gut. However, in the skin, there was an increase of IL-17A producing T cells um, in the skin after application of staph epidermidis. So we can see here that skin microbes do influence the immune system, but is there a function? Is there a biological result as, a, um, as when you do that? So what then Shruti did was use a Leishmania major infection model. She infected the ears of these SPF mice and germ-free mice, and in comparing these two, you see that there is a local cutaneous response in the SPF mice. Um, as compared to uh, much larger than the germ-free mice, but also you see increased interferon gamma-producing T cells in the SPF mice um, as compared to the germ-free mice. So then when she topically associated staph epidermidis in these germ-free mice, you see an increase in the local T cutaneous response as well as interferon gamma-producing T cells that um, are in the ear. And these resemble what you see in the SPF mice, but also here we see in parasite burden that you have a decrease in the parasite burden when you treat or topically um, associate staph epidermidis. So skin commensals can restore immunity to Leishmania major infection in germ-free mice. So summarizing this part, the host immunity and microbial interactions in skin are distinct. In mice, skin microbes can tune the level of activation and function of skin resonant T cells, promote immunity to pathogens, and drive responses locally that are distinct and independent from the gut flora. But what about human skin immunity and microbial interactions? Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of germ-free humans walking around that we can do these types of experiments, but what we have done is started to look at what are the microbes that are on human skin. So again, this is a background for those who are not as familiar with human skin microbiome surveys. These are highly selected due to limited time that I'm not going to go into a lot of all the surveys that have been done. 
You've seen this figure before, but the reason why I'm showing it again is I want to emphasize that in skin, here in pink, there is a wide variation in the microbiome that you see in skin as compared to the other body sites. And that is because the skin surface is highly heterogeneous. And that is one of the reasons why in this study we um, selected 20 skin sites. These are distinct microenvironments on the skin surface, but I, we, I also selected them because they were sites of predilection for skin disease, specific skin diseases for which microbes have been postulated to potentially have a role. Um, and David Relman showed this figure earlier, so I won't, I won't go into it in detail. But rel relative abundance of predominant bacteria appear to be dependent on the microenvironment. So we've talked about this throughout yesterday and some this morning, how there are carefully defined cohorts that we have looked at. Most of these are adults. We've talked about how, what, is the, what happens. There have been the studies um, by Maria Gloria looking at the neonatal period, but what happens after that. Ruth Lay talked about the, at least for the gut microbiome, how that can transition in the first two and a half years. But what about the skin? We don't know that information. In the other next transition, puberty. This is a turbulent period of time for our bodies. What happens between as we transition into adulthood? There is something called a Tanner stage. For those of you who are not clinicians, a Tanner stage is used by pediatricians to assess the level of sexual maturation in an individual child. This is based on the development of breast tissue as well as genitalia, pubic hair, but it ranges from one to five, one being pre-pubertal, five being fully developed adult. So what we have here is we had uh, cohorts of patients that were um, ranging from two to adulthood. So what Julia O oh did in our um, in Julie Segre's lab it was take these data and compare them with each other. And what based on Tanner stages one, two, three, four, and five, we see the striking difference between Tanner stages one, two, three, and Tanner stages four and five. This is from the Nares, but is, we see a similar separation in other body site and other skin sites. What drives that? Here we see a relative abundance chart, which you've seen a lot in these um, talks leading up till now. And here is with Tanner stages one, two, three, and then here is four and five. I do acknowledge that the ends are pretty low um, in these populations. Um, but what we see in Tanner stages one, two, three, that we have increased proteobacteria and more lipophilic bacteria in Tanner stages four and five. That makes sense for anybody who's gone, everybody who's gone through puberty, you recognize that your body is changing dramatically. And one of the things that changes is the further maturation of our sebaceous glands or oil glands in our skin. So it's very possible this may be one of the reasons why we have more lipophilic bacteria, because they can thrive in that type of environment. So we've talked a lot about 16S taxonomic surveys. We've heard some about the virome and several of the investigators looking at that. But what about the fungal microbiome? So more recently, we've um, um, published a project looking at sequencing the fungal organisms on the human skin surface. But in order to do this, we had to go back from the beginning and figure out what, how do we optimize sample collection. And this, this refers back to the conversation we had in the open floor session yesterday. What are the protocols to use? Optimizing DNA extraction, we had to deviate from the standard protocols for extracting DNA in order to optimize extraction of fungal DNA using bead beating, opening the fungal cell walls. What primers would we use? There are individuals who use um, 18S, some who use 28S. There's the ITS region here, ITS1, ITS2. That stands for internal transcribed spacer region. And so based on our, um, our analyses, for us, at least for skin, that ITS1 provides more taxonomic resolution. Um, this alludes back to Jacques Revelle's comment yesterday that just because it works for the gut or for the vagina, it may not work for the skin. And so this is for, at least in our experience, um, ITS1 worked better for taxonomic resolution. So what we did was we had 10 healthy volunteers. I selected 14 sites. These are not identical to the ones um, that we did in the bacterial survey because these are, again, sites that reflect sites of predilection for skin diseases for which micro, um, fungal contribution may be um, playing a role. So in 10 healthy volunteers, we see here. Um, then we, if you look at the relative abundance charts, each of these horizontal lines 
represent one body site. Each of the vertical bars represents one of the healthy volunteers. And one of the most striking things that you can observe here is that malassezia predominates in 11 out of the 14 sites. That's the purple. That's why there's so much purple. But on the heel, toenail, and toe web space, so on the feet, there is much greater diversity. We have fungi everywhere, but it's just a different population depending on where you are. One of the things that um, you may notice is that Healthy Volunteer 7 is a bit different. This individual, again, talking about protocol um, standardization, our eligibility was no one could take, have taken an oral antifungal oral antibiotic within six months of, of being sampled for this um, protocol. And this individual had completed a course of oral antifungal six, seven months prior to being sampled. And so it's not clear whether the differences we see are related to residual effects of taking an oral antifungal or whether or not the person's um, predisposition, they were taking it for a toenail infection, whether a predisposition for a toenail infection represents some difference in their fungal microbial communities. Interestingly, I don't have the data here, but their 16S um, survey for this particular age, um, individual, HV7, was similar to the others. So the um, bacterial microbiome was resembled any other healthy volunteer. But it was frustrating to see so much purple. There's a lot of malassezia, that's not that helpful. But one of the questions we had was, what happens if you speciate? Getting down to the speciation level, how do we do that? Well, we couldn't do that based on the databases that were available. So we had to cultivate our own uh, malassezia and, pro and do genomic sequencing to actually populate the databases for us to be able to speciate. So when you do that, you again see there is striking um, site specificity for skin. Um, Sarkos was talking about how there's specificity in the gut, but also we see that for the skin with regards to the fungal microbiome as well. So we can see in this area here, the external ear canal, behind the ear, um, the forehead, that malassezia restricta predominates. But in other sites, we have the upper back, the back of the scalp, the um, inside hip, those are predominant, but you have malassezia globosa. So even though they're all malassezia, there are specific species that we're seeing at these different body sites. So I did mention that we did 16S. So from these same clinical samples, we did ITS-1 sequencing as well as 16S sequencing from these samples. And what you see here is um, it's interesting anatomically in that those central body sites from the head and neck um, or core body sites listed here, they have a relatively limited number of, um, with regards to rich, richness, rel relatively limited numbers of different types of bacteria and fungi. Whereas on the arms, here's the palm, the forearm, and the inside elbow, there is a higher richness, a greater richness with regards to bacteria, but still relatively limited for fungi. That's different for the feet here, the heel, toe web, and toenail, relatively limited richness for bacteria, but a much greater richness for fungi. So there are these regional differences that cannot be explained just by sebaceous, moist, and dry, and that it's going to require a lot more understanding about human physiology and skin physiology to be able to explain these differences. So just summarizing this beginning portion, the skin bacterial microbiome is highly dependent on the sampled skin site. Um, the neonatal skin bacterial microbiome varies based on mode of delivery. We've talked about that, um, that there are dramatically um, major shifts that we see in the Tanner stages one, two, three versus Tanner stages four and five, um, and that fungal communities over the skin surface differentially um, vary from the bacterial microbiome. Now I'm gonna shift into what my charge was, into talking about eczematous skin, specifically atopic dermatitis, and then briefly I'll talk about some um, data from other groups and our group um, about primary immunodeficiency syndromes and why that's interesting. So for background, those who are not familiar with atopic dermatitis, it's a chronic, itchy, inflammatory skin condition. It is not considered an infectious disease, it's an inflammatory skin condition, yet these individuals respond relatively well to antimicrobials. So there is something going on that suggests a role of microbes. It affects 15% of U.S. children at a high cost, financially as well as socially. The quality of life in these children and in these families is severely adversely um, affected. 
And I mentioned before, there is this association with microbes. We observe, and when we take care of these patients, that disease flares are associated with increased colonization and infections with Staph aureus, but also some, a subset of these patients are at high risk for severe spread of herpes simplex virus infections and if they come into contact with small, smallpox vaccinees. There is something that's been termed the atopic march in that there are 40 to 70 percent of those with severe atopic dermatitis over time go on to develop asthma and then hay fever. So these three diseases are termed the atopic triad. The incidence of these atopic diseases have doubled in the last three decades in industrialized countries, suggesting there may be a possible external factor, and this alludes to some of the comments yesterday by Marty and again today, that it is unlikely that our human genome could change in that period of time and that an external, possibly microbial, contribution may be playing a role. Interestingly, in mice, in murine studies, skin exposure to antigens can result in subsequent mucosal sensitization to those antigens, suggesting that if we could somehow modify what happens in atopic dermatitis, could we then go on and abrogate the development or the, the disease severity of asthma, which has significant morbidity and, uh, and potential mortality, as well as hay fever. So understanding the trigger, triggers of atopic dermatitis may allow us to modify the development of AD and atopic disorders and potentially develop therapeutic targets. So atopic dermatitis is a complex disease. It looks very simple here, but this is not the whole story. But just emphasizing, we've talked about barrier, the gut barrier earlier today, but emphasizing I won't talk about it here, but it is important in atopic dermatitis. The skin barrier we know in um, if you have a mutation in the skin epidermal protein, filagrin, it's highly associated with the development of atopic dermatitis, a particularly the kind that goes on to develop asthma and, a and hay fever. We know the immune system is deranged in these individuals and in that they have extremely high IgE levels and antimicrobial peptides in the skin are reduced. But, and we've also talked about the microbes and that is just one component of this complex disease. So our study, we recruited pediatric patients with moderate to severe disease and healthy age match controls. I sampled them in characteristically affected sites. As I mentioned before, dermatologic diseases have sites of predilection where we find that, and that helps us in the diagnosis of these diseases. But it typically occurs in the antecubital fossa and the popliteal fossa, that being the inside elbow and behind the knee. We selected the volar forearm or the inner forearm as a control site because it's less often affected in, in moderate disease and it's an adjacent site. We also sampled the nares because that is a site of carriage for Staph aureus. And I sampled them during the baseline flare and post-flare time points, and these are just score ad scores, which is um, a method for um, assessing severity in these patients. And you can see that over time, their score ad increases during the flare and decreases after they've been treated. This figure just demonstrates that when you have more severe disease, that we observe a decrease in the bacterial skin communities. But that drop in diversity is not everywhere. It is very site-specific. Again, it is at the sites where we see disease appear, the inside elbow and behind the knee, but not at all time points. This in particular are disease flares. These are the natural, true natural history of the disease, where they have not been putting anything on their skin um, these, the, the blue flares are in individuals who put on topical steroids potentially two days before seeing us or sometime within the seven days before they were sampled. So these flares are truly the natural history of the disease. But what are the bacteria that seem to be driving this decrease in diversity? So looking at the genus, down to the genus level, here are the healthy controls. These are the baseline time points for the atopic dermatitis, the flare time points, the no treatment ones versus the intermittently treated ones, and the post flare time point. And what you can see is that there's a dramatic increase, a significant increase in the pink, the staphylococci, in the skin of these patients during a flare. But we do see increased staph in um, in proportion or relative, relative um, increase in some of these individuals. So that was quite a concern. Again, we had to go down to speciation level because there's Staph epidermidis, Staph aureus. Staph epidermidis, again, is a known skin commensal. Staph aureus is a, is a 
fairly common pathogen. And so it was important to us, at least from the genome level, they're very similar. So we had to know which one was which, because it makes a difference, at least clinically. And so what we did, if you focus primarily on the pink, the staphylococci, and we speciated those, you, it was reassuring to see that most of the staph we see in the healthy controls, those are staph epidermidis, staph hominis, known skin commensals. But what we do observe is, yes, there is an increase in the staph aureus that we see even at baseline, but it is um, a dramatically increase during the flare, the natural history of the disease. We see increased staph aureus, but also staph epidermidis. That was not something we did expect to see, but there is, that is one of the benefit of looking at the whole microbial community with regards to um, disease progression. And then it decreases once um, patients have been treated. And one of the questions people often ask, well, you gave them antibiotics, but often these um, majority of these patients were limited, their treatment was limited to topical steroids, or some of them do take dilute bleach baths, which is like having a small swimming pool in your own tub. Um, so that's what we observed. But what is what remains a question is this this are correlations. Um, what happens to get from this point? To this point, or what can what can we do so that these you never you remain a control? You don't go on to develop atopic dermatitis. Those are questions that remain. Um, we did look at um, the fungal um, communities on the skin. Julia O looked at this. These are baseline flare and post flare for a few of our um, patients who um, had atopic dermatitis. And although you see fluctuations in the bacteria, we don't see as this, that type of fluctuation in the fungal communities on the skin. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, primary immunodeficiencies. There are some cohorts of primary immunodeficiency patients who have eczema skin disease. And the benefits here are they genotypically have the same mutation, they are monogenic disorders, and some of these patients have atopic dermatitis-like skin eruptions. And these eruptions can be antibiotic responsive again, and so that was one of the reasons why we pursued these cohorts. Um, and asking, do common and rare disease, diseases with similar clinical phenotypes, do they share skin microbiome features? And how does the innate and the adaptive immunity shape the skin microbiome? We haven't been able to ask all of these questions, but these are some of the reasons that we, let, we were led down this path. I'm just going to talk about two of these diseases um, in the rest of the, the time that I have, talking about hyper-IgE syndrome, which have STAT3 mutations, um, as well as um, another paper that was recently published um, by Dirk Jeevers and colleagues looking at STAT1 mutations with chronic mucocutaneous candidal infections. So STAT pathway is important, it's a biochemical pathway, and it's um, it's involved in so many things, but these patients have are at risk for infections. On hyper IgE, in, hyper IgE syndrome, they have staphylococcal skin and lung infections, candidal infections, and they can develop secondary aspergillus lung infections. So this is a paper I just mentioned by Dirk Jeevers and colleagues, where they looked at STAT3 and STAT1 mutations. It's hard to see, but these, the leftmost um, groups, these are the STAT1 mutation patients, the middle grouping are the hyper-IgE syndrome patients or STAT3 mutations, and these are their controls. But in general, what you see, just summarizing everything in this little corner, at the genus level, you see increased Carinibacterium species in the STAT1 mutations, you have decreased Carinibacterium bacterium species and the STAT3 mutations. You have increased gram negatives that you observe in these patient populations, decreased Prevotella and de decreased Fusobacterialis. So you, we observe that there are taxonomic differences that we observe on the skin of these um, patients with primary immunodeficiency syndromes. Um, this group went on to do some um, studies of challenging um, PBMCs. These are PBMCs from healthy volunteers. What they initially did was they pre-stimulated them with either um, Carinibacterium acinetobacter or Staphylococcus, and then they challenged them to uh, Candida albicans or Staph aureus. And what this essentially me shows is that if they were initially exposed to Acinetobacter baumani, there was a decreased uh, TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, and IL-22 that was produced on, upon exposure with um, Staph aureus and C. albicans in these healthy volunteer PBMCs. So exposure to certain skin microbes may alter PBMC cytokine response to pathogens such as C. albicans and Staph aureus. 
this is just a snapshot of um, some of our work looking at patients with hyper IgE syndrome, STAT3 mutations, but um, due to the limited time, I will direct you to poster 31, where Julia O oh will talk, will walk you through her analyses that she's looked at in STAT3 uh, mutation patients, but other um, primary immunodeficiency syndromes as well. So briefly, going through summarizing this part, AD flares are associated with shifts in the skin bacteria. We talked about the different species. The specific primary immunodeficiency patients um, harbor distinct skin microbiota, um, and that altering the skin microbiome may alter the PBMC's response to specific microbes, but we need more studies. Um, quickly moving into the gaps, needs, and challenges, since I'm running out of time, these are knowledge gaps. Um, and then I'll go into, as Owen charged us with finding things that frustrate us on a day-to-day -day level, but knowledge gaps here are evolution of the skin microbiome over life stages, what are the physiological factors that contribute to the skin microbiome differences, getting down to understanding skin microbiome and immunity interactions, trying to expand on what has been done now, but to explore that to a greater degree and fully understand how our immune system interacts with our skin microbes. And again, the importance of human and animal models. Uh, we've talked about this, but moving from correlation to causation, but also as our recent survey has highlighted the magnitude of interaction between fungi and bacteria and the role in health and disease. But one of the bigger challenges that um, I, I don't think I've seen anything um, been able to overcome this one challenge is skin metagenomics, and that is due to the low biomass on skin. So uh, I do have a caveat, these are my views, they do not represent the views of the government, but these are some of the frustrations that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, standardization of protocols, we've talked about this, but particularly for skin, I did a non-scientific survey of some of the people who do skin work here, and we have different protocols. I will admit that we don't follow the HMP protocol, we have our own protocol that we've been doing, and we've had to modify that from time to time. So we are just as guilty of not having, following a standardized protocol. Um, the importance of phenotyping patients, making sure are they really healthy, or what are they normal, what diseases, particularly atopic dermatitis, has s several different phenotypes. How do we define what is the phenotype we're studying, and how do you main, um, especially you do that when you're at different multiple sites. Which sampling sites do you do? How frequently? What is the skin prep? The time since antibiotics? What sampling method? Is swabbing still the best way? Um, what are the critical metadata fields that are needed? And it may change depending on the disease state you're looking at. DNA extraction. This is really critical. Um, looking at, especially when you have low biomass. You, um, it's easily contaminated when you're talking about skin. But then when we were looking at fungal organisms, we had to modify DNA extraction. But the primers, PCR conditions, just looking at various abstracts in the past and in manuscripts, there are, they're all over the place. Um, quantitation. This is a key question that I always get asked. How do you know? Can you quantify what's there? And we can't at this point. And that is a major frustration, I think, not just for skin, but in the entire microbiome field. More microbial characterization, where including genomes, where we had to gene, you know, sequence our own malassezia in order to figure out speciation. Metagenomics analytical tools, particularly if you have low um, biomass. And one gripe about data submission, um, we, you know, when we're submitting a manuscript and having to do dbGaP and SRA, that is a major frustration. Um, again, my own opinions. So then, if I can move on to the acknowledgments, if they will, it's not, there we go. This, um, I'd like to acknowledge my close collaborator, Julie Segre, and I have um, underlined here, as well as fi uh, photos of the um, postdocs work who I've highlighted here, but there are many collaborators um, within my own group, but then also um, collaborators among, across different institutions, but especially our patients and volunteers. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you so much for that great talk. So we do have time for a question, if there is one out there. Oh, come on. Go ahead. <laughs> that was a lovely talk. 
in your discussion about the areas we need to work on methods, I think today, as I was talking with a colleague, we've seen very few slides actually on the methods that are used in any of the studies, particularly in humans, whether it was a wet, a wet cotton swab, whether it was a brush. Uh, you know, I think that as part of the uh, methodological discovery process, we all need to disclose or discuss exactly what the methods are as we're going forward, even in presenting data such as we have here. I know from the papillomavirus field, we went through decades of methodological considerations that were critical. So I applaud your you know, pointing these out and I encourage everybody to start including more specifics on exactly how they've collected the specimens, processed, stored, et cetera, so we can understand that as we're interpreting the data. Thank you for your comments. Yeah, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, when you show the results, uh, you show the fungi changes, mm -hmm. and you went very fast. Basically, you didn't do much comments, but I think I saw Malassezia globosa increasing in the skin of the, in the flare. Can you comment on, on that? Uh, if we're, are you talking about the atopic dermatitis one? This one? Or were you talking? Uh, or were you talking about the? Yeah, that, that one. Yeah, so this one I will comment. This particular individual was um, Tanner stage four. And so what we see is um, it's possibly related to, although this was a pediatric patient, that they had already transitioned through puberty and had more oils on their skin. And so that's why we see that Malassezia globosa is dominating potentially in this individual, or it may be something unique to this individual. And we just, with a small N, it's hard for us to tease that out. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so for our next talk, we'll be, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, you can clap. <laughs> our next talk, we'll be moving on to the lung microbiome. Our next speaker is Gary Huffnagel. He's from the University of Michigan. And the title of his talk is The Lung Microbiome, Challenging Old Paradigms About Microbes and the Host Respiratory Tract. 